This week we get into chapter 11, which covers the early Baroque vocal music. This includes Baroque opera and the chamber cantata. I am curious as to whether you've been to an opera or not and what you thought about it, uh, as to whether you'd be open to going one, to one at some point in your life if you haven't. And if you're not open to going to an opera, why is that? That's the topic for this week's discussion, and I'm, I'm curious to um, hear your reactions to that. In this presentation, I'd like to talk about some of the history of early Baroque opera and go through uh, some of the terminology as it applies to opera. The, the Renaissance, as you know, saw renewed interest in the art and scholarship of ancient Greece and Rome. However, the classical influences on Renaissance music were minimal because the musicians didn't have direct access to the ancient music. They could only study writings that discussed the effect of music from a philosophical standpoint. The writings had little influence until the tail end of the Renaissance when a group of scholars and musicians, they were called the Florentine Camerata, they became excited about Greek descriptions of music. This music had the power to reach inside the heart and change people's feelings. So I want to ask you, what do you think this kind of music would sound like? Composers who tried to write such music must have drawn inspirations from Orpheus or Orfeo. He was a mortal who in Greek mythology played the lyre and sang so beautifully that he moved the shades and demons of the underworld to tears. One style that developed from these experiments was something called the recitative that comes from the word recite. This was an emotionally charged dramatic style of singing for solo voice with simple accompaniment often on the lute. Based on principles of good oration, the music tried to match the natural rhythm and register of a speaking voice as it, ex as it expressed different emotions. So this was a really big shift that took place between the Renaissance and the Baroque. If you imagine a tragic poem about a, the loss of a loved one, for example, did you listen to Monteverdi's Lamento della Ninfa and read the text? That's pretty tragic. If, imagine this tragic poem about the loss of a loved one and think about which would be more powerful or more moving, to have a choir read the poem in unison or to have a dramatic actor recite the poem alone. What do you think? Well, in the Renaissance, it was um, the vocal ensemble that figured so prominently, but in the early Baroque, it was considered to be more um, intimate, more effective to communicate this with one person to an audience. To communicate to, uh, from one person to an audience, emotions can be depicted with greater directness and immediacy. So that the big shift that took place is that the vocal ensemble that was so prominent in the Renaissance proved unwieldy and impersonal in the face of the dramatic demands made by the Baroque composers. The recitative style quickly quickly became much more popular, and uh, the accompaniment was simple. It was just a series of very basic chords, and they served as the foundation for the very flexible, expressive melody that would take place above it. This new vocal style became known as the monodic style. So here's that funny looking slide again. This time it has some bold lettering above it that you know mentions that one of the big changes, as I said, that took place at the beginning of the Baroque was the shift from polyphony to, mono to monody. Um, the polyphony that we heard in the Renaissance would include the example of the, the motet by Josquin, the mass examples by Palestrina, the madrigals, and so on. And then the shift to monody is where you would have a solo singer singing over a, a foundation of simple uh, chords, the accompaniment played by the basso continuo. That was the big shift. And that is um, the style that's typical of the early Baroque. Now, if you haven't been to an opera before, you may very well enjoy this early Baroque music. Um, I would suggest that if you haven't been to an opera before, maybe go hear something by Mozart or Handel or even Puccini or Verdi, the Romantics. Um, it's not that early Baroque music isn't beautiful, but it has this kind of singing style that sometimes feels like the brakes are on. I guess what I'm trying to say is that Baroque opera, at least the early Baroque opera, is not the easiest to sing along with. However, that being said, in the hands of Monteverdi, we get some of the most beautiful and emotionally intense music ever composed. Here's a little bit about Monteverdi's life.
Monteverdi was considered to be the leading figure in music around 1600. He was actually considered to be quite revolutionary. He was considered to be the last great madrigalist and the first great opera composer. You see his dates. He had one foot in the Renaissance and one in the Baroque. His first operatic masterpiece is called Orfeo, which is our book example. We have a few short excerpts from that opera. Monteverdi wanted to create music of emotional intensity, and he felt that earlier music had conveyed only moderate emotion. He wanted to extend its range to include agitation, excitement, and passion. And to achieve this, he used dissonances with unprecedented freedom. And to evoke angry or warlike feelings, he introduced new effects, including pizzicato and tremolo. Before we get into the opera terminology, I want to talk a little bit about the first operatic masterpiece called Orfeo by Monteverdi. Like many Baroque operas, this uses Greek mythology as subject matter. Orpheus, son of the god Apollo, is ecstatically happy after his marriage to Eurydice, but his joy is shattered when she's killed by a poisonous snake. Orpheus goes down to Hades, hoping to bring her back to life. Because of his, his beautiful music, he's granted this privilege on the condition that he doesn't look back at her while leading her out of Hades. Of course, during an anxious moment, he does look back and she vanishes. So, kind of unhappy, but the sort of happy ending is that Apollo pities Orpheus and brings him up to heaven where he can gaze eternally at Eurydice's radiance and the sun and stars. All right, I'd like to go through some of the vocabulary regarding opera. Opera started in Italy and literally means work. Opera is a dramatic work in which the actors sing some or all of their parts. It usually makes use of elaborate stage sets and costumes. Um, what, differ what differentiates an opera from a musical is that usually the actors sing their parts, mostly. And, and the style of music that was written for an opera would be more like art music. So, for example, if you've seen Phantom of the, Op Phantom of the Opera, is actually a musical, not really an opera. Operas are usually created from the joint efforts of a composer and somebody called a librettist. The libretto, or little book, is the text of the opera. That, that, those are the words. Uh, you may recognize the picture on the right up here. That's Mozart. And to his left was a man um, named Lorenzo da Ponte, who wrote the libretti for several of Mozart's really famous operas, including Don Giovanni. So here's the definition with a little more information. The actors sing their parts. They're uh, usually put on at pretty big expense because of the elaborate stage sets and costumes. Opera did emerge in the northern part of Italy. It was first promoted by this group called the Florentine Camerata. The Florentine Camerata was an important group of musical amateurs who met to discuss literature, science, and the arts. Um, in fact, Gal Galileo's father was one of the members. They wanted to um, revive the Greek dramatic style and a new style of singing with the aim to recapture the expressive power of ancient Greek music. And while I'm going to let you guys listen to the rest of this on, in your active listening and also in the links that I provided, this is an example of that expressive solo singing style. Eventually, two elements of opera emerge. We don't hear a huge distinction in them in, the, or in Orfeo. It's something that happens a little bit later where they become more clear-cut, but the two elements are the recitative and the aria. The recitative often leads into the aria. Um, the recitative would be the vocal line that imitates the rhythms and pitch fluctuations of speech. It's during the part of the opera when something's happening in the plot, action is taking place, the words are sung quickly and clearly, often in repeated tones. The recitative often leads into the aria, or song for voice, which has the orchestral accompaniment. In an aria, the character's feelings are, are revealed, um, the action stops and the singer spills their guts. The aria is a, um, becomes a complete piece in itself. It's usually clearer in form, repetitive, and shows off the singer's voice. <laughs> 